Good morning, everyone. I'm Dina Reese, Superintendent of Catoosa County Public Schools. Welcome to our annual Local School Governance Team Annual Training. I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Lynn Plunkett. Dr. Plunkett is a retired Georgia School Superintendent and now consults for the Georgia Department of Education, the Technical College System of Georgia, and the Georgia Charter System Foundation. Welcome, Lynn, and we're ready to begin. Thank you, Mrs. Reese. Um, I always enjoy working with my friends in Catoosa County. Um, I, uh, part of the, the work that I do with the Georgia Department of Education uh, as a consultant is provide support to charter systems across the state. And um, Catoosa County is one of those charter systems that is assigned to me. So I've been working with you all for a long time, actually all the way through your journey. Um, in getting your application for charter system ready, going through the process of, of approval by the State Board of Education, and then working with you for the past um, four years as you've been doing some absolutely amazing work. So I'm always happy to be able to be with Catoosa County folks. Um, so let's talk about what we're going to be um, looking at today and, and some information that both Mrs. Um, Reese and I will be sharing with you. We're going to start out with what is effective governance for charter systems. And we're going to talk about how everybody who's involved in that charter system work, the what their jobs are, what their roles are, um, how you all can work together to maximize the power of your charter system governance and your shared decision making. So we're going to spend uh, the first part of, of our time talking about this governance piece. Then Mrs. Reese is going to share some information with you about some of the challenges that uh, Catoosa County school system was facing a number of years ago and um, why you all decided as a community to become a charter school system. Ms. Reese is also going to talk with you about some of the innovations that um, have taken place in your school system, some things that have uh, really innovative practices that have improved your school system and certainly created a lot of opportunities for students and um, for them to, to increase their potential. Um, then she's going to turn it back over to me and we'll talk about some kinds of decisions that school governance teams make and we'll look specifically at what you all are doing in Catoosa County. And then we're going to spend a, a, our last part of our session today on talking about broad flexibility. What is that? And how can a charter system use it to benefit students? Um, if you have any questions, as we are going through, please jot them down. And if you will just send those questions to your principal, your principal will then forward those to um, Mrs. Reese and she will get back with you to answer your questions. So some of the information we have today, you may know, you may find that you are having some, some um, things that validated that you have learned before. You hopefully are going to be learning some new things. And so please be sure that you're jotting down those questions and sending those to your principal. And then she will forward those again to, um, to Mrs. Reese. All right, first of all, let's take a look at effective governance for charter systems. So charter systems um, are, are um, they were actually put into or the, the process for becoming a charter system was actually put into law. Um, so it is in legislation. It's not mandated. School systems don't have to become charter systems, but if they want to, there is support in Georgia legislation for them to do so. And some of the things that are in that legislation will deal with um, the local school governance team, which we're going to talk about in a few minutes. It deals with what kinds of responsibilities that the school system has and the, the responsibilities of the Board of Education and the superintendent and the school governance teams. And it also is going to, the law also talks about um, the responsibilities of the State Board of Education 
um, has to those systems that choose to be charter systems. But one thing that is very, very clear in the law and that is very important in charter system work is that a charter system must maximize the use of local school governance. Now, what that means is that in every uh, school, there must be a local school governance team, and that local school governance team must have parents, teachers, and community members involved. Now, they can have anybody else, and depending on our school systems, we have, um, we have school systems that might have um, some of their social service agencies, their support agencies um, that are involved, or we may have, we have some systems that may have some parent involvement coordinators involved. It all depends on the, the resources, the needs, the culture of your community. So you can add to this group of parents, teachers, and community members as you choose but you must have these three groups represented. And the local school governance team at each of your schools must have some kind of decision-making authority in some very specific areas. Those areas are personnel, financial decisions, curriculum and instruction, resource allocation, which again, uh, focuses to some degree on your financial decisions. Um, establishing and monitoring the achievement of school improvement goals and school operations. Now, we're going to spend some time later this morning um, where we really kind of delve into what this means and we really look at what you all are doing in your district. But just to give you a little overview of what the, the minimum requirements are um, in the law, for this decision-making authority. In personnel, the only personnel decision, according to Georgia law, that a school governance team must have some input into is who is going to be um, the principal in that building um, in the case of a vacancy. And the law does not say how school governance teams are involved in that decision. That is up to the, the that's a local decision. It is spelled out in the contract that a charter system has with the State Board of Education, but it is important that that local school governance team have some sort of voice in um, who the principal is or in what kind of characteristics that principal should have. Um, so again, we will talk in more detail later about how you all are doing that in um, Katusa. Financial decisions, all of our schools have a school budget. Um, and so there are a lot of things that your, your school district will um, take care of in terms of finances for your school. They're going to pay the light bill. They're going to pay the water bill. They're going to take care of the maintenance on your building. But, there, but schools have a school budget that is allotted to them by the district. And there's also, um, there are also funds that go into that budget that can be generated through the school, like fundraisers, um, you know, different things that you do in your school to, to raise money that you can use for you know, purposes to benefit your school. So your school governance team should have some input and certainly they should know what that school budget looks like. And um, at the very least, they need to be informed of it and approve or to have some input into the development of that um, school budget and how those funds are used. Uh, curriculum and instruction, we have a state curriculum. It is called the Georgia Standards of Excellence. But your real um, decision making comes in how you provide instruction and how that instruction is delivered. Um, resource allocation, there are a lot of different resources. We have personnel, we have um, financial resources, we have in-kind resources through some of your partners in education. So how those resources are allocated 
um, can also be a part of that scope of work of your school governance team. Establishing and monitoring the achievement of school improvement goals is really the number one um, piece of this decision making that is so important for school governance teams. Um, because everything else, all the other decisions that a school governance team makes needs to somehow tie back to the achievement of that school improvement goal, um, such as who is going to be leading your school or what kind of characteristics do you want for that person? Um, how do you make these financial decisions and resource allocation decisions that best, that best support your school improvement plan? How can you work with curriculum and instruction to best support your school improvement plan? And then in school operations, how can you use the operational side of your school? Um, bell schedules, calendars, safety plans. Uh, in our situation now, um, COVID plans. How can we use those kinds of operational things to best support our school improvement plan. And again, we're going to talk in more detail about how you do this in Catoosa as we move on through this morning. Now, Georgia law makes something else very, very clear. It does make it clear that school governance teams have some decision making authority. But it also makes it very clear that the schools within a charter system are under the control and under the management of your local board of education. And, you know, on both this slide and the one previous to this, you see some letters and some numbers. It says COCGA. Okay, that's the actual citation of the law. So, um, you know, I wanted to be sure that you know that, yeah, these, these um, pieces about the school governance teamwork is in Georgia law. It is in law, it is part of that contract that your district signs, that your Board of Education signs. So, you know, it, a lot of people early on when charter systems were first coming about felt that the school governance teams were going to take over and they were going to take the place of the, the Board of Education or take the place of the superintendent and nothing could be more um, incorrect the superintendent and the local board of education certainly give consideration to recommendations and input of their school governance teams, but the local board ultimately retains its authority. It has constitutional authority because they are elected officials. And while the superintendent is sharing some of her decision-making authority with the school governance teams, the final say so at the end of the day is going to come through that local board of education. Now, one thing that I would say to you, and, and I, I, again, having been a superintendent in a charter system, um, there are some things that your superintendent is simply going to know about that you all may not know about. There are things that are in a bigger picture that you may not have that total picture at your local school level and that's okay that that's fine for that to happen but you have to have a lot of trust in charter system work because when your superintendent says to you that is not something that we can do right now you have to trust that on the flip side your superintendent certainly has to have a lot of trust in the um, decision-making ability and the fidelity of that uh, school governance teamwork. So in charter systems, you're constantly working on building trust and communicating. As a superintendent, I found that that was probably the biggest job I had was making sure that the communication was very, very clear. And that went two ways. It wasn't just my communication to the school governance teams, but it was their communication back to me. Um, so people are always wanting to know who our charter systems are. We do have 48 in Georgia, and you'll see that I have highlighted Catoosa 
Um, your first year was in 2016, and um, you will be renewing your contract with the State Board of Education in 2022. Um, you did ask for an extension for a year. Um, I think you, you have a lot of stuff going on there. You have a new College and Career Academy, a lot of great things happening. So it just worked better to um, for you all to ask for a year's extension. So you'll see in looking at these different school systems, we have school systems that became charter systems as early as 2008. Uh, we had four systems that were our first charter systems. Um, we have a lot that have come on in the years after that. And then we have some that have, like Franklin and Chattahoochee County, that have come on board as recently as 2020. So um, the charter system work is, it's, it's very, very effective. We are seeing um, when we look at student achievement data across the state that our charter system work, our charter systems are producing um, extremely high student achievement. Uh, the graduation rate just came out. Our charter systems were all you know, doing just extremely well in their graduation, um, their graduation rates. So we have school systems that were not charter systems that have decided they want to become charter systems. And I think also people are beginning to realize the power that comes when you have an entire community that is focused on the education of its students. Now, I mentioned that you all in Catoosa um, have had an amendment to your contract. Most of the contract or the contracts are usually for five years. They, the uh, contract um, cycle for the state of Georgia is no longer than five years. Um, it used to be a little bit longer, but that has been changed. But we do have those ending dates varying um, because we do have a lot of different things that come into play that um, require a system or that would benefit a system if they have um, an extension, if they have uh, more than five years in their contract. And some of those things might be that they're trying to align with accreditation visit or they're trying to align with the opening of a college and career academy or they're trying to align with um, uh, some other something else that or they've had some extenuating circumstances. So when you look at these end dates, you're going to see that not all of them are five year um, ending in five years. You will also notice that we've had a lot of our districts renewing their contracts. And again, I'll be working with Katusa. Uh, next year, and we'll be working on uh, working with you, Mrs. Reese. Will be working with school governance teams, with the board, um, in developing your contract for your next contract cycle. All right, so let's take a look at what um, school governance teams look like in Catoosa County. Um, you have a seven to nine member board, and I also, this is a good time to say this, you, you all developed this. This is part of your, your bylaws. It was part of your contract. Um, it was part of the work that went into developing your charter system work. So you have seven to nine members. Your principal is a non-voting member, except if you have a tie. You have two certified staff members that are elected by your certified staff. Um, but you also have a caveat in there. Your principal may appoint one of those two staff members. You have two parents um, who are not school employees, and those are elected by the parents. You have two business and community members who are selected by the school leadership team. And at the middle and high school, it is optional, but the middle and high school as, uh, school governance teams could have one to two students who serve in a non-voting uh, capacity and they are selected by the school leadership team. And it's important to remember that the certified that the staff members are representing the staff, bringing the staff perspective to the table. The parents are bringing the parent perspective. The business and community 
are bringing the business and community perspective and your students would be bringing your student perspective to the table. Um, you, your school governance team members have staggered terms two-year terms, um, and those run generally August 30 to September 1st. Um, you have a two-year term limit, um, and that is really good because it allows more people in your community or in your school or more of your parents to be a part of that school governance team work. Your members um, may not serve on multiple teams, and that again um, just allows more people to be involved and it also lessens the chance of having a conflict of interest as well as this particular caveat which is multiple family members may not serve on the same team and again that helps to um, broaden you know deepen the pool of candidates who can serve also it lessens the um, chance of having um, any problem with conflict of interest. Now, your general governance team responsibilities, if you'll notice in this slide, we have school improvement highlighted. And that, again, goes back to what I said earlier. The school improvement plan is sort of that hub of where your work belongs. So, you know, general governance team responsibilities are adopting and in many cases, helping to develop the school improvement plan and any updates that come from that. Certainly reviewing the progress on your school improvement plan, understanding, knowing where your students are. You don't have to be a statistician. It's not important that you understand all the nuances of data analysis, but it is important that you know if your students are making progress. Is your school making progress toward its goals? And if so, what are you all doing that is promoting that? And if not, what do you need to be doing to promote movement toward those goals? Um, it's important for the school governance teams to um, participate in some way in identifying some of the best practices in instructional programs or operational practices or processes for your school, looking for resources and looking at how you can innovate. All of these, again, improving student achievement. All right, we've talked about school budget, and it's important that you remember that the work you do on that school budget is work that is focused on funding that school improvement plan. And in many cases, we have our school governance teams approve that school budget. And then uh, the last one, we've already talked several times about hiring the principal in case of a vacancy, uh, or school governance teams sometimes have input into performance goals. Um, and they can provide feedback on the performance of the principal. They do not evaluate the principal, but they can provide some feedback into um, different pieces of the work that is taking place in that school. But again, all of that again goes back to implementing that school improvement plan. Um, it's important to behave. You know, you, we shouldn't have to say that adult, but sometimes we do. People you know, are very, very passionate about their students and they're very passionate about their schools and they're very passionate about their communities. But when you're working as a school governance team, you're bringing a lot of different voices to the table that haven't always been at the table in education. And one of the things that I think is the hardest thing for new school governance teams and new charter systems to, to sort of get their heads around is how do we work together as a team? How do we make sure that we are um, respecting the chain of command, that we are not going over the head of the principal or going over the head of the superintendent, um, you know, that we're representing all students. So that's where your code of conduct come in, comes into play. And I believe that your code of conduct can be found in your bylaws. If you all have not reviewed that this year, it would probably be a good idea to do so and to do that early in the year so that there isn't any misunderstanding. 
And a lot of our systems, our school governance teams sign both a code of conduct and a um, conflict of interest um, statement saying that they understand what the code of conduct is and that they do not have any conflicts of interest. And conflict of interest basically means that you can't, as a member of that school governance team, you cannot do anything or make any decisions that would result in personal gain for you or someone in your family uh, or a friend. So um, that's a really important piece because when you get sidetracked and sidelined with um, misbehavior or conduct that is not conducive to the, ch the charter system work or the school governance team work, then you lose focus on what is most important and that is working with each other to create the best environment for um, education for your students. So just, you know, a lot of school um, school governance teams, co uh, codes of conduct, you know, they, they look different all across the state, but these are some things that we as um, consultants and as the DOE and as Charter System Foundation recommend that you really think about um, not providing direction to staff or influencing staffing decisions unless that is officially part of your work as a school governance team representing all students, not just certain groups of students. You know, being informed about matters that come before your team. You know, if you're given something to read or something to um, some kind of homework before your meeting, it's important that you that you are prepared when you come to that meeting. Focusing on facts related to student achievement. You know, I, a lot of us get caught up sometimes in that rumor mill. And one of the big uh, important pieces of work that our school governance teams can do is to help dispel those rumors and help um, our community understand what the facts are and not what the rumors are. Um, and, and, you know, if you don't feel comfortable articulating that, you can always say, you know, I don't think you have that information. Um, I don't think that's correct information, but let me point you to our principal. Our principal can help you um, understand what the facts are. Um, and, and that, again, that goes with this communicating community issues to your principal. It's so much easier for your principal to handle a situation out in the community that has the potential of becoming a real problem. It's much easier for your principal to handle that on the front end than to try to handle it on the back end when Facebook has gotten involved and Twitter and Instagram and everything else that's out there. Um, you know, participating in training, which you are doing today, you are required to have one annual training. And um, so that's what we're doing today. You can certainly have more trainings, but participating in those and attending meetings and being an active participant is extremely important. Um, I think it goes without saying that collaboration, speaking with one voice, you know, if you don't have the vote go the way you want to, you still support what your school governance team voted to do. You support your majority. You don't go out and say, well, it's, I didn't make that decision. I thought it was a really bad decision. You don't do that. If you're going to be on that team, you're going to go with one voice. Um, remembering that individual school governance teams have absolutely no authority, just like your school board. Um, every action, every business action, every vote must be taken in a meeting and the discussions that you all have must be in a meeting. You are under the Georgia Open Records and Open Meetings laws um, and you can't discuss and make decisions and vote on things without being in a meeting that is open to the public. And then as a school governance team member, you are a mandatory child abuse reporter. Um, if you don't know what that means or you don't know what your protocol is in Catoosa County for that, then this would be a good time for you all as a school governance team to find out what your protocol is and talk about it. 
Um, child abuse reporting can get very messy um, and there are a lot of legalities that go with it. So it's always really good for you all to understand what your district uses as its protocol there. Um, a lot of times we get questions when we're working with school governance teams about what's the difference in a charter system governance structure. Well, if you look at the right side of the board, you see that you have a, a local board of education, a superintendent, principal, and school staff, and that's going to be the case for any school system in Georgia. It doesn't matter, you know, whether it's a charter system or not. And all of those entities have certain responsibilities. And again, that is not going to change. That's always going to be there in, in the state of Georgia. The, the, what makes a charter system different is what's on the left-hand side of the board, where you have a local school governance team. And that local school governance team sort of undergirds and supports the work of everybody on that right-hand side of the slide. Um, your school governance team provides more voices, more input, different perspectives, and they support the work that is taking place in your school system. And then just as we have quality in teaching, we also have quality standards in school governance. Um, it's important that your school governance team, the composition reflects the diversity of your community. And, you know, diversity can be defined in a lot of ways, not just um, racial and, and ethnicity, but also in the socioeconomic, um, you know, looking at the, the different aspects of your community and making sure that you do have folks on your school governance team or you have representation on your school governance team that does reflect what your community looks like, your school community. Um, and, and, you know, it, the bigger your systems get and you start having different, you know, communities involved, um, sometimes you might have a community in a local school governance team, school community, that might look very different from a community in another school. Um, and I'm going to give you an example that really illustrates this, um, this diversity of your community. Um, when I was superintendent in Floyd County, we have a community, um, the name of it is Cave Spring, and Cave Spring has an elementary school. And Cave Spring is also the home of the Georgia School for the Deaf. So a lot of the, um, the citizens of Cave Spring are members of the deaf community, the hearing impaired community. And so it's very important that at Cave Spring, when we were looking at developing our school governance team, that we made sure we had um, representation for that hearing impaired community. That was really important to us. And we didn't have that in, you know, our other communities, but in that Cave Spring community, we did. So it was really important that the school governance teams that were serving that community, um, for the schools that were serving that community, really reflected that hearing impaired community. Um, it's important to meet regularly and, as I said, comply with open meetings and open records laws. Staying in governance and not in management, it is not your job to manage the day-to-day -day operation of the school. That's your principal's job. Um, exercising your school-level governance responsibilities, taking that seriously, um, understanding the importance of the work you do, and then getting those regular updates on all aspects of your school. And again, participating in, in regular um, school governance team training is certainly important every year. All right, so now I'm going to turn our training over to Mrs. Reese. And she's going to talk with you about some things that um, you may or may not know about challenges and innovations um, that you all have in your district and really kind of the background of why you became a charter system. Thank you, Lynn. Um, as, as Lynn mentioned, um, Catoosa County Public Schools became a charter system 
uh, in June of 2016. The Board of Education spent six months in 2015 listening to stakeholder groups and everyone agreed that becoming a Georgia charter system was the best option for our students and the school system. The main reason that we chose this governance option was to formalize decision-making authority for parents and business partners through our governance teams. The Board of Education and I agreed that the people who are active in the schools on a day-to-day -day basis should have decision-making authority for the school's students. Your input for innovative strategies in your school is truly making a difference in student success and achievement. Part of the application process to become a charter system was we needed to identify the challenges that we were facing and how we planned to address those challenges. The three challenges that we identified were preparing students and teachers to use 21st century technology productively, increasing the number of students who graduate prepared for college and or career, and providing academic programs and support to improve student achievement. The innovations that we came up with to improve student achievement include flexible grouping. When I was principal, students who needed academic support were assigned to a remedial class for an entire semester. The charter system flexibility allows us now to provide intervention and remedial services based on a student's need, so our groups are fluid. When a student masters the content, then they move out of the group, and it doesn't depend on a semester date. PE credit for extracurricular activities and band. My son participated in band while he was in middle and high school. And because of that participation in band, it limited the number of electives he could take. We decided that students in sports and band participate in enough physical activity to earn that PE credit that's required by the state. So now they can earn the health credit through our online academy and it frees up their time in their schedule for an additional elective. Retention flexibility. Georgia law requires that students have to pass the milestone test in third, fifth, and eighth grade to be promoted. In Catoosa County schools, we don't think that the promotion or retention decision should be based on one state test. And so we waive this requirement and we use multiple data points to make the decision that is critical to the student's future academic success. And expenditure flexibility. We waive the requirement for program-based expenditures that now allow our administrators and the school governance team to make expenditure decisions that improve student achievement. Upgrading our classrooms with 21st century technology and preparing students and teachers to use technology productively in the classroom was a foundation for success in overcoming our challenges. The community overwhelmingly supported East Lost 5, and in 2016, we launched the Let's Get Connected initiative to provide technology devices for all of our students and modern equipment for classrooms. A major project in East Boss 6 is to refresh the students' individual technology devices and update classroom technology. In addition to equipment, we also focus professional learning for teachers to integrate technology into instruction in a way that prepares our students with skills for success in a 21st century global economy. When we planned to launch the Let's Get Connected one-to-one -one initiative, we knew that adding more devices would require us to increase technology support. We developed a plan to use charter system flexibility to allow students to earn a high school technology credit while getting paid by the school system as an intern. Flexibility allows the students to earn the high school credit without actually sitting in a technology class. In addition to course credit, Students gain real-world experience and they earn a paycheck. The system has expanded this program with Ringo Telephone Company, so students are participating in internships in a business setting while earning high school course credit and getting paid by the business. The Let's Get Connected and Katusa U internships also support the goal for students to become college and career ready through technology skills and work experiences. When we presented our charter system application to the State Board of Education, they strongly suggested a college and career academy become the cornerstone for the system's plan for the future. When we renew our charter in 2022, 
I will be thrilled to inform the Charter Committee that Catoosa County Schools earned a $3 million grant from the Technical College System of Georgia, and we will be opening the From Here to Career Academy in 2023. The new College and Career Academy on the Benton Place campus is another major East Block 6 project. Georgia College and Career Academies are specialized charter high schools that increase the high school graduation rate while preparing students for college and career. The From Here to Career Academy allows high school juniors and seniors to explore career pathways and earn college credit, technical skills, superior professional skills, and work experiences. Attending the academy prepares students to be successful in post-secondary education and highly skilled for good paying careers in our region. We launched the first From Here to Career Academy program in August of 2019 at the Georgia Northwestern Technical College, Catoosa County campus. GNTC has a state-of-the-art industrial systems technology lab and classrooms, so this pathway will always be located at their campus. In August of 2020, we launched a new pathway in cybersecurity, a new cohort in industrial systems technology, and six of our current students who are juniors remained in the program for the second year. Students participating in the College and Career Academy programs have the following benefits. Free college tuition through dual enrollment. In Georgia, students can earn 30 hours of college credit and parents don't pay tuition, books, or college fees. Students earn industry recognized technical college credentials that enable them to graduate high school and begin a good paying career. Work experiences and hands-on learnings increase relevance and student interest. Students have the opportunity for paid and unpaid internships. The From Here to Career Academy emphasizes professional skills and life skills development that enable students to be highly successful. Students who successfully complete a technical college pathway and professional skills development classes will develop a professional resume and prepare to enter the workforce or continue their post-secondary education through mock interviews. Students who want to begin a career are guaranteed an interview with Pathway Business Partners. Based on regional data and a business needs assessment, we are planning the following career clusters for the From Here to Career Academy. The School of Law and Justice and Emergency Management. The School of Nursing, Sports Medicine and Therapeutic Services. The School of Information Technology and Cybersecurity, the School of Construction and Design, the School of Welding and Machine Tool Technology, the School of Education, the School of Logistics, Distribution and Supply Chain Management, and the School of Industrial Systems Technology, Robotics and Mechatronics that opened in August at Georgia Northwestern Technical College. Pathways in each of these career clusters include dual enrollment, so students earn college credit while in high school and the programs are vertically aligned with post-secondary education for students who want to complete a two or four year degree. The College and Career Academy is a very exciting initiative and it demonstrates the Board of Education's commitment to preparing students for success in college and high demand, high paying careers when they graduate from high school. Thank you, Ms. Reese. And I wanna say um, just kudos to um, Catoosa County and 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 I y'all are doing some amazing work there and I, I also want to let you know that um, the Charter System Foundation um, does a does a, a number of regional workshops throughout the state every year right now they're all virtual um, and we also did a virtual uh, conference uh, back in October and a lot of what you all are doing in Catoosa County was highlighted as best practices. And I just want to say, great job. You all are doing some amazing work. You're, you're doing things that are very innovative and very unique, but they're all tied back to the needs and the resources that you have in your community. And they're tied back to the success of your students. So job well done. Um, all right, so now we're going to take a look at that decision making that we talked about earlier, and we're going to look at what actually, what does it look like in um, Catoosa County. Now, part of your contract that your State Board of Education has 
with the lo- with the, the the state board of education has with your local board of education. Uh, part of that contract is a decision making matrix that really lays out what um, what are the the parameters for your school governance teams in in the decision making. So I, I wanted to just um, spend a little bit of time talking about each of those five areas and looking at what you all are doing in Katusa. All right, first of all, um, you'll notice as we go through the next few slides that that you're, you set it up in Katusa so that year one, there was a more of a basic level of decision making that increased in year two and then increased more in year three going forward. And a lot of that, that was a very, very smart move on your part because what it did is it allowed your school governance teams to learn about curriculum, learn about resources, learn about financial, learn about personnel before they really jumped into this whole um, big piece of decision making. So what you all did um, for in your school improvement piece is that in year one, which was 16 and 2016, 2017, your school governance teams reviewed the school improvement plan and that allowed them to learn more about school improvement planning process. In year two, they went into a um, a monitoring mode where they actually monitored the implementation of the school improvement plan and were able to make um, recommendations about that plan, about updates to it. And then in year three, which was 2018, 2019, and then going forward, so this is what is in place now, um, everything that we had in the other two years plus approving the school improvement plan, uh, school governance team members serving as members of that school improvement team, um, school governance team recommending use of flexibility to improve performance and to uh, achieve your charter system and your school goals. And then in looking at personnel decisions in the first year, your teams interviewed principal candidates and made a recommendation to the principal, to the superintendent. Um, and the year two, this, the teams provided input into some requirements they wanted to see for substitute teachers, which was really unique. That's something we don't normally, you know, we don't often see. And I think that's a very important piece of the work. Okay, and then year three and going forward, um, the school governance teams made recommendations for staff positions specific to the school. So what you all did, you started out with what the law required, which is input into the principal candidate or the principal selection. And then it broadened so that you really are, um, are working with a lot more of your staffing uh, school wide now than, than you did in your first year. All right, in terms of um, financial decisions and resource allocation, in the first year, you reviewed the school budget, you learned about school budget. In the second year, you provided recommendations for the budget during that budget process. Um, you approved fundraisers, you started looking at priorities and aligning those with your school improvement plan, you know, looking at how to best spend the money aligned with your school to support your school improvement plan and then you um, started to recommend the use of your charter QBE funds and we haven't mentioned this yet so let me take just a minute as a charter system you get additional money from the state um, it equals out to about around $88 per student and you take all the students in your district and you um, multiply that times 88 and that gives you roughly the amount of money that you all get as a charter system. And that's to help you implement the innovations that you're doing and supporting your school improvement plan and using that flexibility. But it's really, really largely focused on implementing those innovations and um, training and providing support to your school governance teams. 
Um, the amount of money that is allocated each year is, is allocated by the legislature and the um, amount varies according to what the state budget looks like for each year. So sometimes it'll be, you know, a little bit below 88. Sometimes it'll be a little bit above. Um, in the first years, early years, it was $100. And then through the recession, you know, it, it reduced a little bit. Okay, year three and forward, um, you began to make recommendations for staff positions, again, specific to the school and um, approve your system, your school's budget for charter system funding. Um, in curriculum and instruction, the first year you reviewed the curriculum and all those different materials that accompanied that, and you began to learn about curriculum. And then the second year and going forward, um, you began to make recommendations for some innovative strategies for delivering instruction and looking at some innovative um, programs um, for teaching, looking at how you're going to work with your acceleration um, and your remediation opportunities. And uh, Dana spoke to those earlier. Um, looking at graduation requirements and program offerings and looking at what you all needed to do in order to, um, to have policies that supported the success of your students where programs and, and graduation requirements are concerned. And then you also began to, to really um, uh, have some, some input into using broad flexibility, which we're going to talk about in just a few minutes. Um, in school operations in the first year, you approved your system calendar from two different choices and you made a recommendation to the superintendent. In the second year, um, you added recommending parent involvement activities and approving fundraisers and using those revenues, how they were going to be used, and then reviewing uh, proposed field trips and providing input into those. And then year three, you added um, reviewing and recommending changes in school operations. Uh, for example, partnerships, um, co-curricular activities or extracurricular activities, um, doing stakeholder surveys, getting input from your community, communication strategies, things along those lines. Um, something that you do in Katusa that is, I think, very, very smart and it's a little bit, it's kind of unique. We don't see it in all of our systems, but you have a group um, that meets with the superintendent and what you all call that group is your ACE team um, and that is your superintendent's advisory council for excellence. And um, the school principal and one non-staff school governance team members serve on that team. They meet with the superintendent twice a year and they provide feedback and advice to the superintendent regarding the work of the school governance teams. And what that does, it allows the superintendent to kind of keep her finger on the pulse of what's happening out there in all of the teams, but it also gives your teams an opportunity to communicate with each other. And that's really very, very important. Um, especially in a system that's a larger system as uh, Katusa is. You also have a set of school governance team bylaws. And if you have not taken um, some time this year to review those, I think it would be a great idea for you to do that because these bylaws really dictate the way you operate as a school governance team. What you've chosen to do in Katusa is to have a common set of bylaws, and so they're used in all of your schools. Um, they are approved by your Katusa Board of Education. They are reviewed annually, and they may be amended um, if the school governance team requests that, and if the amendment has been presented to the superintendent at least 30 days prior to the board meeting. Um, and in your bylaws, it really outlines how you operate it. It outlines the training requirements, your meeting attendance, what your roles and responsibilities are, how your officers are elected, how you engage your stakeholders, um, how you can make appointments, how your committees work, how you remove members if that 
is a, is a, a need. Um, and it also talks about your open records and open meeting laws protocol. Okay, so the last section that we're going to uh, focus on today deals with this broad flexibility. You've heard it mentioned. You've seen those words on the screen a number of times, and you heard um, Ms. Reese talk about using broad flexibility to innovate. So let's dig a little deeper into what this means. All right, broad flexibility is the freedom that charter systems have by virtue of this contract that they have with the state board and the local board. And this freedom allows them to basically ignore most of the laws that are in Title 20. And then most of those State Board of Education rules and guidelines that accompany that Title 20. All right, Title 20 is a section of Georgia law that governs education. It is very, very big. It is very, very prescriptive. It's very, very detailed. And in a lot of cases, what has happened is that one school system had a problem. And the way they solved that problem is <clears throat> that their legislatures were able to get a law passed. Well, when that law became part of Title 20, then all 180 school systems in the state had to abide by that law. Um, even though it may have created, it may have solved a problem in one district, it more than likely created problems in another district. So when you think about Title 20 and you think about having 180 school systems in our state, that's like trying to make 180 round pegs fit into one square hole. It just doesn't work. Our school systems are all different. They are all unique. They all have their strengths. They all have their areas of, of the needing improvement. They all have challenges. They all have different resources. And, and those don't look alike in any two systems we have anywhere in the state, even if you're next door to each other. So this idea of broad flexibility is intended to be used as you are designing and implementing programs, innovations, um, processes, protocols in your school system based on the needs of your students and your community. And the whole purpose of doing this is to improve student achievement and support your school improvement plan and your district strategic plan. So it's very, very important that our school governance teams, as well as boards of education, superintendents, district office leaders, understand the power of this flexibility, but that they also understand the responsibility that comes with this flexibility. Um, the responsibility, you know, it's, it's extremely important to use your flexibility with integrity and use it with fidelity so that every decision you're making is going back to that school improvement plan and providing the best opportunities for students. We do have a few things that are not included in broad flexibility. Um, no federal laws are included in that. So anything that comes under the uh, U.S. Department of Education cannot be waived. You don't have a contract with them. You have a contract with the State Department of Education. And um, pretty much the other things that can't be waived fall into three categories. And that would be civil rights, um, protection and health and safety of students, staff and visitors in your school building and accountability. And so those are the three big areas. So any laws or rules or guidelines that fall into those three big areas, then you cannot waive those. That's that is unlawful. Everything else is included. And what I've done is I've listed some of the most common uses of broad flexibility. Um, most of our systems use it in looking at how instructional time is used, um, how you're structuring the school day and the school year, 
how your school is staffed, um, how your teachers in some some instances compensation models, especially if you're have somebody coming out of industry and um, you know the compensation they were getting in industry is not equal to the compensation they would be getting as a first year teacher in a school system. Um, we do have a little bit of a um, little bit of, of leeway in federal funding and some flexibility there. Um, through the use of consolidated funds, which means that you can um, kind of blend your federal, state, and local funds to support your school improvement plan. That's the only piece of federal law that we have any flexibility over. Um, how instruction is delivered, who delivers it, where it's delivered. It doesn't always have to be, as, as Ms. Mrs. Reese showed us, it doesn't have to be in the four walls of a classroom. Um, looking at how support services are provided and looking at what is taught in addition to the state curriculum. And there are many, 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 many more um, uses of, of um, flexibility, many more laws that are being waived. And I think um, in our recent months with the pandemic, we've exercised flexibility in ways that we never, ever imagined that we would. And, and our systems are doing a great job with it. As with everything, there are facts and myths. Um, a charter system does not, once you get that, that um, contract, you don't have to ask the state for permission to use the flexibility. Now, in most systems, and I'm sure you do in Catoosa, there is some sort of protocol um, for vetting the way that this flexibility is used so that you don't have schools going in, you know, all these different directions because you're still at the end of the day, it's school level governance, but it's also supporting that district strategic plan. So there's usually a method of um, vetting or, or approving the use of, of waivers at the, the school level. So if you, if you don't know what that is, that would be a good thing to ask. Um, charter system flexibility, uh, as I said, doesn't mean that you are free from federal laws. It doesn't look the same in all charter systems or even in all schools within a charter system. Um, you know, I mentioned to you Cave Spring Elementary School, which was a school in, in Floyd County. Um, they use some of their flexibility to work with the students at the Georgia School for the Deaf. And they provided a lot of art um, opportunities through through um, partner partnering with Georgia School for the Deaf. And that didn't look like that in any other school in my school system. Um, it is important when you're looking at using your waivers that you align those to the strategic plan for your district and to your school improvement plan. Um, implementing innovations are so important. We can't just keep doing what we've been doing. You always have to look for ways of addressing challenges as they come and supporting that overall improvement of student achievement is always the end game, always. Your school governance teams absolutely need to have input into development of innovations. Um, and some of the best innovations that I have heard around the state have come out of school governance teams. Um, and as I said before, you can exercise the use of your waiver whenever you need to. As your challenges arise, then you use your flexibility to address that, that problem. All right, very quickly, I'm just going to go through some examples of charter system waivers. And, um, and, and what I'm going to do is to show you what would happen if a school could not or a district did not have that uh, benefit of, uh, of the flexibility. So let's say, for example, we have an elementary school and um, Dana referred to this. So you all are actually doing a lot of this. Um, we have an elementary school maybe that has several students and they just don't meet program criteria for gifted or for remedial programs. So you wanna know where does this program criteria come from? 
Well, you see in the middle of that slide, it says SBOE rule. That's a State Board of Education rule. And those two rules absolutely lay out how a student, what a student must uh, do in order to qualify for gifted or for remedial instruction. And the reason we have those laws is that gifted programs and remedial programs do earn more state funding because you sometimes have to have some specialized training for your teachers, specialized certification, you tend to have smaller classes, so you get more funding. So these, um, not every student qualifies, even if they need those services in those classes, they may not qualify to be put into those classes. However, with flexibility, you can just ignore these two state board rules and you can do um, something that we call serving your students by need and not by label. So you would determine what your gifted delivery model is. You would base it on your students' needs. You could serve advanced or very motivated students in the gifted class. By the same token, you could take students who are in need of remediation, put them in the remedial classes. Both of your classes may exceed the state's maximum class size, which is also included in that rule. You're not going to get any more funding for putting those students who don't qualify in there, but you're going to be able to serve the needs of your students. And at the end of the day, that's really what we want to do. Okay, under human resources, um, you all have a college and career academy, and I'm sure you've already begun to find out that many of your college and career academy business partners are advising you that students and many of your career pathways can benefit from the expertise that comes with hiring somebody who's actually in the field. Um, but state law requires teachers to have a teaching certificate, and that state law is cited for you down there at the bottom of that slide. So here's how you would find a solution to that challenge um, with your flexibility. You can hire, for example, you could hire an RN, registered nurse, to teach anatomy and physiology. Or you could contract with a local chef to teach culinary arts. They would not have to have a teaching certificate. I can tell you most of these folks are not going to want to come out of a job that they've spent a lot of years going to school to do and then go back to school to get a teaching certificate. So um, that has proven in our college and career academies and in our um, technical and career programs to be so valuable across the state. So you also have a challenge, and this may not be as much of a challenge for you all, but in our small rural areas, it's really hard to find certified teachers in the specialty areas such as art. So um, many of our small rural districts are hiring local artists to teach part-time or full-time and provide art instruction, for example, in grades five uh, K through 5. But we've also begun to see that move into our middle school and high school with hiring technology, um, people who work in technology, people who work with computers, um, again, working, you know, with culinary arts, um, providing art and music in our high schools, uh, dance, piano. We have some systems that are able to really provide some opportunities that their students wouldn't have otherwise. Okay, and financial flexibility, um, let's say that you have a school system, um, a school and a, uh, the, the school budget and the school system budget aren't based on system improvement plans or school improvement plans and the student's needs. Instead, you know, without having flexibility, you have to base your budgets on how Georgia law says you can spend the money. And again, if you see this OCGA with all these numbers behind it, those are laws that specify how money has to be used. So when the money comes from the state to the district, it comes in kind of pots of money. It comes in a transportation pot of money. It comes in a, um, a an instructional pot of money. It comes in a 
remediation pot of money. It comes in a professional development pot of money. And so you get a, all these different pots of money, figuratively speaking, um, with amounts of money in there that have to be used for that specific purpose. Well, sometimes, and in most cases, that's not how a school district needs to use their money. So by using flexibility that you get through being a charter system, you can take those funds, throw it all together, and you can create your budget based on what the needs are in your district. So you can use, for example, funding that's marked for professional development to um, shifting it over to maybe something with math achievement or working with your English language learners. Or you could take something funding marked for remediation and you can use that to provide transportation for summer classes. So it really opens up a lot more doors. And then in terms of operations, let's say that you have a, a middle school that um, the school calendar and the school day schedule just don't meet kids' needs. I mean, you just, they're just, it's just not set up to meet some really, some needs in some very strategic areas like career exploration or social emotional support services and programs. And you want to, you know, you might ask, well, why is it not set up that way? Well, this, all these laws here in the middle are laws that tell you how middle school has to operate. And these have been on the books for years and years and years and years and years, and very little change has come to them. Well, we all know middle schoolers have changed a lot over time, just as all of our students have in their needs. So what you can do with your flexibilities, forget about everything in the middle of this page, and then you might just create opportunities for career exploration, for example, in your middle school by restructuring the school day. You might give a full day of career exploration, you know, intermittently throughout the year. You might add opportunities for students to have some social emotional support services and programs. And that is highly needed with our middle school kids. Um, you know, that's a really tough age anyway. And sometimes we get so caught up and a lot of the meeting the academic goals that we forget about those goals. So, um, you know, you can just really, again, open up a lot of doors and a lot of opportunities for your students um, by kind of looking at that middle school criteria and figuring out what you need to do differently in your district. Um, I want to give you, just leave you with a couple of um couple of things. One is these are the folks who work with you across the state in your charter system work. Um, we have the Charter System Foundation. You see the website there. There's a lot of really, really good information on there, including um, training videos. So if I have said something throughout the course of this morning about some area that you don't understand, like maybe school operations or curriculum and instruction or personnel, you can go to this website and there are training videos. They don't last very long. I think the longest one is about 20 minutes. And um, all those different areas that school governance teams have decision-making authority um, awarded to them in those areas, there is a video, a, a training video and some other training materials on each one of those five areas. It's also a um, a good uh, training video on effective meetings. There's one on roles and responsibilities of, uh, of uh, school governance teams and superintendent and boards of education. Um, so that's a really good site. You can also go in and look at videos and PowerPoints and resources that have been provided by um, other charter systems. And so you can kind of get an idea of what's happening across the state. Dan Weber is the executive director and Pam Talmadge is the administrative assistant and um, Dan Weber is actually the he was was the senator who wrote the charter system law and he is an attorney in Dunwoody and he spends a lot of his time as the executive director 
of this nonprofit, um, providing um, advice and providing legal counsel and um, really doing a lot of lobbying and advocacy for our charter systems. Uh, Sherry Gidney Sherman, Emily Limbeck, and I serve as the three consultants for the Charter System Foundation. And we are all former charter system superintendents. And uh, the Georgia Department of Education website is there, and we work with the uh, charter schools division of the Georgia Department of Education. So if you're ever looking for more information or you know looking to, to find some other resources, then just check back to this slide and, and that, that, that gives you some um, good starting places to look for those resources. And then lastly, just as a personal note for me, I just wanted to thank you all. You're doing such great work as school governance team members. It is a thankless job sometimes. Um, you know, you, you certainly don't get paid for this work. It is a, uh, on a voluntary basis. But the work is so very, very important because you are making a difference in the lives of your students. And so I just want to tell you how much I've enjoyed being with you today. I want to remind you to please send questions to your principal if you have them, and your principal will forward those over to Mrs. Reese. I hope you all have a great weekend, and I hope that um, the upcoming holiday is going to be wonderful for you and that you enjoy some time off and enjoy some time with just giving thanks for all we have. Thank you very much.